Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone across the, the globe in whichever time zone that you're in. Um, we are, I'm in a, for a real treat today because I get to introduce a good friend and colleague, Ludovic Orlando, who is currently a CNRS research director at the University of Toulouse. Uh, Ludovic has won numerous awards and tons of international research funding to the tune of millions of dollars. He's one of the most decorated and impressive ancient DNA researchers <clears throat> on earth. And though he's pioneered research into ancient methylation and for a while held the record of the oldest DNA ever retrieved at 700,000 years old, he's primarily known for his cutting edge and comprehensive insights into horses. Uh, this is demonstrated by the fact that any browser search for Ludovic Orlando automatically fills first with horse and soon after that with Google Scholar. Uh, both of which reveal his outsized impact on both ancient DNA and horse domestication. In fact, it's not an exaggeration to say that Ludovic's lab has generated more ancient genomes on horses than all other labs working on all other ancient animals combined. Uh, he's a force in nature and his insights have led to unprecedented insights into the shared history between humans and horses. And I wanna thank Ludovic uh, for uh, coming today and telling us what the, the whole story of horses so that we will walk away knowing absolutely everything that's ever been known uh, and very much looking forward to your presentation today. Thanks, Ludo. Thank you so much, uh, Gregor. I believe that you all hear me now and that I have to uh, just share my screen, isn't it? So let me just try this. And I assume that you will see my screen now and probably I would you know, put myself away here. Looks great, Ludo. All right, great, beautiful. Okay, so um, uh, good morning and good afternoon or evening uh, to all of you, and that's really a pleasure for me to be to be here. Of course, I would have rather have got that one uh, for real in San Diego, but that's the way it is. Um, so thanks also, Gregor, for the kind words. Um, I don't feel any pressure at the moment <laughs> to to say to say the truth. So uh, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to present some of the work that my lab has been doing for say almost a decade now, trying to use ancient genomes to reconstruct the whole process of horse domestication. And uh, horses clearly are uh, one of the species that have fascinated humans uh, the most. Uh, we know this. In fact, uh, by simply looking at the archaeological record, for example, horses in Western Europe, they are the animals that are the most represented in the cave art record. And uh, as shown here in the form of figurines, for example, this one was actually excavated in Germany 35,000 years ago, or in the forms of beautiful cave paintings, really, uh, such as that one from France, the, the country where I stand at the moment, uh, which is the Chauvet cave, and that also dates back to about 35,000 years ago. So for most of our history, really, uh, our relationship to horses has been only to hunt them or to uh, represent them somehow. But this changed dramatically uh, from the minute we started domesticating them. Uh, and this was somewhere around four to 6,000 years ago. Because from that very moment, of course, horses, they gave us an opportunity to travel way faster than we could with our own legs. And the consequence of that is that all of in a sudden, we could actually connect regions, peoples, uh, also their genes, but also their goods, their culture, their uh, diseases, in fact, uh, to unprecedented scale. So in addition to really make the, the world feel smaller, uh, what horses have given us really is a way to be a lot more efficient at killing each other out, really, in terms of war making. First, uh, we have the charioteers and the bow, bows and arrows uh, in the Bronze Age, but uh, really uh, in the Iron Age, starting with the, uh, the uh, mounted cavalry. And this lasted up until very recently, in fact, these mounted cavalries, up until the beginning of, of the 20th century, because this is no fewer than uh, 50 millions of horses that we lost to uh, World War I, in fact. So because today uh, the, there has been a mechanization of weaponry, but also because we invented almost 100 years ago the motor engine, of course, horses are no longer uh, instrumental for the uh, uh, Western world or for Western societies. There are only about 60 million of horses that live on the planet today, and they are spread across about more or less 600 breeds or so across the world, 
uh, and besides the domestic horses that will be the topic of my talk today, there exists only one single population that is considered as the last truly wide uh, horse population living on the planet. But there are about 2000 of such horses and they are called the Shavolsky's horses. And these were in fact declared extinct in the wild uh, in the 60s, but they have been saved from extinction uh, for, from a massive conservation efforts in captivity, so in zoos. So if you were to uh, uh, select a range of domestic species here, or, or, or breeds in fact, and, and the range of animals from the Shavolsky's population and sequence them their genomes out, as we did in 2015, uh, you will see that the SNP variation can actually best fit a leaky isolation model uh, in which uh, those two lineages started uh, uh, to diverge about 35,000 years ago, and but they remained uh, uh, in connection uh, with an asymmetric gene flow from Shavolsky's lineage into the future domesticated lineage uh, up until the, the end of the last glacial maximum, somewhere around 19,000 years ago, uh, and then they remain isolated for most of their history. So if you're doing this genomic comparison, really you realize that because the Shavolsky's horses are, are not ancestral to the domestic lineage, but they are actually a sister branch, this comparison will not really inform on the genetic changes that will really come together with the, to, together with the domestication process because the domestication process only uh, took place in the most terminal part of this branch here. So there will be a lot of false positives if you were to really count the number of differences between those two lineages that way. Uh, and this comparison, in fact, will be even more noisy because uh, this has been shown by our group and by other groups that some domestic bloodlines actually introgress back into the Shavalsky's bloodline uh, during the captivity history. So that means that we can't really use modern genomics to really uh, understand the early stages of horse domestication. And so that's why my group has been really interested into using ancient genomes, in fact, to travel back in time and map out through space and time the genetic changes that came together with the domestication process to answer questions such as when did we first domesticate the horse, uh, where did we do so, also how did we manage to, to do so. And as you saw, horses, they have got such an impact on human history. We are equally interested into understanding how uh, the process of horse domestication circled back to uh, human evolution and history in terms of their mobility and in terms of warfare, obviously. So of course, I won't get into many details today uh, about the technologies that we're using, except for saying that we need ancient DNA facilities to do this kind of work because we have to make sure that we do not sequence the, the contamination from modern horses as we sequence the past. But the good news is that even though our technologies are destructive, we only need about 100 milligrams of bone powder to be able to retrieve uh, enough complex um, complexity, molecular complexity, to build NGS DNA libraries that we could shotgun sequence on the Illuminate platform and align back against the horse reference genome to, at the end of the day, characterize the genomes of the ancient horses, regardless of when and where they lived, uh, to about 1x to 25x coverage in the very data that I'm going to show you today. So when we had access to this technology, uh, the first idea we had was to travel back prior to the domestication time. And the, the idea was naive when I think about that today, but the rationale was that we should actually go to the north of, of Eurasia, Siberia, because it's cold. So the, the bones will be very well pres preserved and the DNA will be equally so. And if we can access such samples, then they, we could probably get high coverage or high quality genomes. And uh, this is what we did on these three samples. We managed to retrieve uh, high quality genomes from a 43,000 year old bone, a 16,000 year old bone and a 5.2,000 year old bone. And the idea was very simple is that they should be sitting on the branch leading to the domestic of today, the modern domesticates. And therefore we could actually uh, chart through time the genetic changes that 
took place from 43,000 years ago to 16, then from 16 to five, and from five into the uh, modern domesticates. Um, and this is the tree that we obtain when we uh, uh, characterize the SNP variation of those three ancient uh, horses that I'm showing here in, in dark blue. And as that we compared against the SNP variation, of course, present in the modern Chevalsky's horses, as well as the in green, as well as the uh, modern uh, the, uh, variation present in the domesticates today in red. And so you realize that those three ancient genomes, this was sort of interesting because they are all clustering together in a monophyletic group uh, that diverge even further back in time than the divergence between the Swarovskis and the domesticates. So what it told us is that we identified an archaic lineage of horses that nobody, including ourselves, had no idea even existed, a sort of uh, equivalent to Denisova uh, for humans, if you will. So that was cool, three ancient genomes. They reveal a whole new range of genomic diversity. But for the question we asked, uh, this divergence was too deep because it was even deeper than the divergence from the Chevalskis, so that it could not inform at all about the genetic changes that will actually take place along the branch leading to domestication. So in terms of understanding with these genomic data sets, uh, the genetic changes that came together with the domestication of the horse, well, we were back to square zero. So we already had to switch gear and uh, to go somewhere else back in time and uh, in, uh, in place also. And so what we decided on doing was to go to this very place, the Botai site in North Central Kazakhstan. This is a site that dates also back to 5.5 thousand years ago. And the reason why we were so interested into this archeological site that you see here is that archeologists, they can actually excavate uh, houses. So houses will be circular. So if you were to excavate there, you will see houses, but you also find pits in which a lot of, of animal bones will be accumulated, but really tons of. In fact, this is more than 300,000 of animal bones that have been excavated at Botai 5.5 thousand years ago. And the interesting thing for us today is that 99% of the bones, they really are from horses. So for archaeologists, really, it seems to suggest that the Botai people, they develop a subsistence economy, mostly, almost uniquely based on horse exploitation. Archaeologists, they can also uh, identify evidence for enclosures. So we know that the Botai people, they also um, uh, did calling. Um, and on top of that, we know that they were bridling their horses because the teeth, especially the second premolars, they show some typical V-shaped um, uh, uh, traces of bit wear or damage at the surface of the teeth that is characteristic of bridling. And in addition to this, we know that the Botai people, they were also milking their horses. And we know this from the isotopic signatures of the fatty acids that we can retrieve 5.5 thousand years later today at the surface of the pottery of those people. So really because the Botai people, they were milking their horses, breeding their horses, uh, uh, corralling their horses, and also exploited them by huge numbers, uh, we could reasonably expect that the Botai genomes will actually sit ancestral to the very uh, branch leading to the modern diversity of domestic horses. So that's why we sequenced 25 genomes of Botai a few years ago. And we also added about a hundred of, of additional ancient horses shown here in orange that are spread across Eurasia and date back to the last 4.2 thousand years to so as to study the post Botai genomic changes after the early domestication. And this is the, 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 the population model that we retrieve when analyzing this new variation present in our data set, in which uh, the Botai horses sit darkly ancestral to the branch leading to the modern Chevalskis here in green. And they do not sit at all along the branch leading to the modern domesticates shown here in red. And those two branches are fairly independent genetically because we could estimate that it was not more than about 2.7%, less than 3% of the genomic diversity that would have flown from the green branch on the left to the uh, modern domesticate. So almost no connection between those both. So there was a, a one important conclusion of this is that 
Well, Botai people, they started the domestication process 5.5 thousand years ago, but this process was somehow abandoned. And it only, those horses only lived until today in the form of what we now have to understand as the feral Shavolsky's horses. And in addition to that, because the modern diversity sits on another branch, we all of in a sudden discovered that there was a second domestication source a second domestication center that we call DOM2 for the rest of my talk. And uh, this uh, process really came as a replacement for the first one. Probably somewhere around 5,000 years ago or 4.2 thousand of years ago was the time of this replacement because this is the age of the latest bowtie related horse that we could identify in our data set genetically and the earliest DOM2 genome that we could identify in our data set. So we know that when the second domestication process took place about five to 4.2 thousand years ago, but we were back to square zero about the web. So that's why we had again to switch gear and this time what we decided on doing instead of focusing on a single site was to really go uh, crazy and sequence as many horse genomes as we could have access to across Eurasia prior to, during and following domestication. Of course, we focused a lot of our attention to this key time period where the first domesticated horses were replaced by the DOM2 somewhere around 4,000 years ago, as you can see here. But we also sequenced quite a large number of the uh, more, more ancient genomes of horses, if you will, because we wanted to understand the, genomic, the genomic makeup of the wild populations as well. Uh, to make a long story short, we had a total of 264 additional ancient genomes doing that work that we started comparing with each other. So this is the diversity that we could uncover on this multidimensional scaling plot. Uh, there are a lot of, of lineages that I've already talked about today. You see in orange, the DOM twos again, you see the Bowtie horses in green, the Shavolsky's horses in green as well, and my archaic uh, lineage sort of equivalent to Denisova, uh, as I've said here. But we also identified a new series of lineages that we had no idea existed. So the situation seemed to be very complex at the genomic level. But luckily for us, we were able to see some logic in this diversity. And especially, we um, identified that the genomic variation in terms of the genomic ancestries that we could identify in each and every genome. So these are the colors that you see here on the pie chart. Each color is a, is a dominant genomic ancestry. Uh, prior to 5,000 years ago, so by the time of the Bowtie and before, uh, there is a strong geographic pattern in the distribution of those ancestries. You see, for example, the green ancestry dominating around Bowtie in Central Asia. You see an orange ancestry dominating here uh, around the Black Sea and, uh, and the Caspian Sea here. And you see a dark blue somewhere in Siberia and more. So because there is such a strong phylogeographic structure, we could leverage the patterns of genetic dissimilarity through space and, and use the EMS software to really map out the uh, uh, effective migration surfaces that you see here in the continuous colors. So the deeper the blue, the larger, the higher the gene flow, if you will, and the, 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 the more brownish, the, the, the lower the gene flow, the more the space will act as a barrier, if you will. So you see that before 5,000 years ago, really Eurasia was nothing but a barrier for horses. That means that horses were not migrating at a large scale. The situation was truly the same between 4.2 and 5,000 years ago. Again, we retrieved the same migration barriers that I've mentioned just before. But truly the situation changed dramatically as we moved after 4.2 thousand years ago, because there is no longer all the genomic ancestries that you see here, only one dominates. This is the orange ancestry. And you see that it dominates at the scale of the whole continent. And again, the migration surface are all deep blue, suggesting that this was a time from 4.2 thousand years ago when horses went out of their uh, uh, homeland and then spread across the planet. 
This is also a time 4.2 thousand years ago that was quite interesting because if we look at the genomic uh, genetic variation present on the mitochondrial genome to your left or at the Y chromosome to your right and reconstruct this, this uh, demographic uh, uh, trajectory, so time is on the X axis and the effective size is on the Y axis, you realize that this is around 4.2, 4, 4,000 years ago that there is a massive explosion in the uh, reproductive size of first populations. So that means that this is clearly at that time that humans have started controlling their reproduction in huge numbers. So because there was such a strong phylogeographic structure of, of prior to 5,000 years ago, uh, we decided that we could leverage this and uh, fit the, 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 the spatial distribution of the genomic ancestry to deep neural networks, and then use this training set so as to predict the genomic, the geographic origins of those horses that uh, were dated back to the last 4.2 thousand years. To say that differently, we asked using deep neural networks, where was living the most likely ancestor of each and every of those horses before, before meaning prior to 4.2 thousand years ago. And this is the pseudo likelihood surfaces that we have obtained, regardless of their age, that they date back to 1,000 years ago, uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, or 4,000 years ago, all the domestic horses that we have sequenced actually originate from that very small geographic region that is the north of the Caucasian range, the Pontic Caspian region that we identified through that work as the true geographic homeland of the Domtus, the Sagan uh, center of horse domestication. So now we knew the where, we, so we were left with the how question. How did we manage or how come it was only that lineage that we managed to spread? Uh, was there anything special about that lineage? And because we are geneticists, we could ask the question whether or not there was something special genetically. So we did a very simple test here, which is a genomic scan in which we uh, FST contrast those horses that spread the dumb twos versus all the losers, those that were eventually replaced, if you will, the non dumb twos. And really, two genomic regions stood out as massive outliers reaching near fixation in the dumb twos. One is on chromosome three, and the second one is on chromosome nine. So the one on chromosome three is actually picking at a gene that is called ZFPM1. And this gene you can actually is expressed in some particular classes of neurons and that you could actually manipulate uh, in the lab using some drugs such as baclofen, for example. And we, when you do that to mice, what you realize is that they will start after being treated with baclofen, after modulating the expression of ZFPM1, you will realize that the mice, they will bite each other out a lot more. So we could think about that gene as a sort of uh, behavioral gene. So we could reasonably hypothesize that the earliest um, uh, breeders, those that started and, and succeeded into domesticating the DOM twos, actually selected early on a variant of the ZFPM1 that was probably uh, making the horses a, a bit more tameable. The be their behavior may have been a lot easier to handle. So the second peak was actually not picking within the CDS of a gene, but in the promoter of a gene that is called the GSDMC gene. And this is a gene that we know um, uh, to, to, to cause uh, chronic back pain and spinal lumbar stenosis when overexpressed in humans. Uh, uh, in humans where this GSDMC is overexpressed, you have a compression uh, on, the, on, the, on the spinal cord here, which at the end of the day result in such a pain that even walking becomes almost impossible. So we could reasonably think again that probably the variant that was selected early on so as to succeed into uh, DOM2 domestication was probably a variant that was um, uh, making the horses naturally 
uh, predisposed to locomotion or to have a stronger back. And what is really interesting, I believe, is that at the very same time, as we see genetically the done to horses spreading across Eurasia, this is also the time when archaeologically we see uh, a spread of horse equipment in the form of some bits, as you can see on the bottom left here, that really spread across Eurasia, mostly in Asia, somewhere around 3.95 thousand years ago and 3.75 thousand years ago. And also in the form of another kind of horse equipment, which is a vehicle that we call the chariot because they have spoke wheels. So here you see a human buried together with two horses. This is their skull on the, on the top corners of, of the grave here, and you may recognize here uh, wheels that are spoked if you look from, from, from the side, in fact, right? And these chariots, they're truly spread in Asia specifically 4.1 thousand years ago to 3.8 thousand years ago. So it seems that we have a situation in which not only the engines, so these are the horses, the dumb two horses, but also the vehicles and the equipment, so the chariots and the bits, spread hand in hand. And for sure, when you have such a phenomenon taking place, for sure it must have impacted the patterns of human migrations. And this is very true in Asia because some equivalent work uh, uh, that has been done in human populations, not in horse population, and they have identified uh, a, a genomic ancestry that was actually confined in the uh, Ponticaspian region here in dark blue. And this genomic ancestry started spreading across Asia somewhere around 3.7 thousand years ago. It was already present in the Tuva Republic, in Mongolia, and reaching out to, to China, in fact. So really, we can say literally that dumb to domestication together with the chariots have been really key in terms of driving a new wave of human population migration uh, into Asia, somewhere around 4,000 years ago-ish. But in, in Europe, the situation was dramatically different because the same genomic ancestry in deep blue, we know it already spread 4.7 thousand years ago, which is 500 good years uh, before the spread of the horses themselves. So by this simple observation, we could conclude that the situation in Europe was different and that the horses were not fueling this massive migration that took place towards Europe. And uh, we could actually confirm this because this point that you see in Germany, where almost three quarters or at least two thirds of the human genome becomes uh, traces its uh, ancestries back to the uh, Pontic Caspian region, we look at the genomes of the horses from that very region and that very culture that we call the Calderware ceramic culture. And you really see that they do not have, to your right, a genomic makeup that is maximizing at all the genomic ancestry that is maximized in the Dome 2 horses, the orange one. They are truly different horses. So we have a situation in which the migration into, into Europe did not obey to the same logic as the migration that we spotted into Asia. So you can see that the ancient genes, they can tell us a lot about the early stages of horse domestication. But of course, not everything stopped for 5,000 years ago, because during the last 4,000 years, we have kept on selecting and mixing and, and, and doing things with these dumb two populations, so as to engender the whole diversity of horses that I've started my talk uh, um, with. So, of course, because we sequence whole genomes across the last, say, 5,000 years, we could actually go back to each and every location of the genome and tr trace the uh, allelic trajectories for uh, variants that we know are driving some important phenotypes for the horse industry. For example, cut coloration phenotypes. Here you see a chestnut horse or those driving the size, as we heard from the previous talk in dogs, but those also driving speed, for example. So I will only here show some examples of this work that we've done recently. 
for example, focusing on one very variant on the TBX3 gene that can, in Asia, explain as much as 20% of the size variation within Asian breeds. So there is a single uh, nucleotide polymorphism at this location of chromosome 8 of the horse genome that, when overexpressed, uh, results in longer uh, limbs during uh, uh, development. Here, what we did was uh, engineering some mice uh, that were actually um, um, uh, uh, carrying the, uh, the uh, horse uh, uh, derived uh, mutation. And we could confirm that at week two or week 11 of their development, indeed, their limbs were actually significantly longer. So we went back to our data set. This is the geographic and time distribution of the data set. And we could, using this, actually reconstruct the allelic trajectory of the G allele, the polymorphism, the derived one is a G here, to realize that it started uh, this allelic frequency to rise monotonally uh, from two to 3,000 years ago. In fact, bang on the time of the emergence of the first Qin dynasty in China, which is notorious for being the first to have um, unified China, but also which is very famous for the Terracotta army uh, that was uncovered about 15 years ago uh, to celebrate their first emperor, uh, so living 2.3 thousand years ago. So uh, as far as size uh, is concerned, it seems that selection for longer sizes in horses actually came pretty late somewhere in the Iron Age and probably from 2.3, 2.5 thousand years ago, not earlier than this. We could look at another variant that is known to drive longer sizes in, in non-Asian non domestic horses. This is a, 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 a SNP again that is located in the ZFAT gene, and we saw the same picture of a, a rise in al the derived allele frequency somewhere around 2 to 2.5 thousand years ago. So again, regardless of the, of the variance driving size variation in, in horses, it seems that we started selecting uh, for longer sizes quite late in the process during the Iron Age. So the same exercise we could do for cut coloration, for example, at this MC1R variant driving the chestnut coloration in horses. And here we uncovered the situation which is very different uh, because there were some moments uh, where the chestnut coloration seemed to have been very uh, fashionable. So the frequency actually came uh, to become quite large, but there are also some periods of time, especially during the uh, Middle Age, where this, at uh, the end of the Middle Age, where this uh, coloration was actually negatively selected, it seems, and then it came back to, to, to be popular during the most recent times. We also looked, for example, uh, at uh, uh, SNPs driving uh, uh, speed at short distance, for example, uh, at those two locations, the PD4 gene and the, uh, the PD4 genes indeed, and uh, the ACN9. And we saw uh, that the rise in frequency was actually only very recent, no older than the last 1,000 years. So as far as sprint at, uh, or uh, speed at short distance is concerned, it seems that this is a trait that became really popular in breeding only very late in the history. So of course I could multiply the examples, but I will not do that because as we have the whole genome, we could also look at the whole genome variation, genome-wide, and measure the diversity changes that we can uncover from our data set. For example, in terms of heterozygosity of each and every genome. So each point here is a genome. We measure the heterozygosity as a function of time during the last 4,000 years, only conditioning on those horses that maximize the done to ancestry, of course. And what we uncovered is a situation in which the heterozygosity was actually fairly large and stable for most of the last 4,000 years ago, but the situation changed dramatically because we identified a 16% drop of heterozygosity of individual genomes within the last 200 years. So this told us that there has been a massive change in breeding practices in which horse populations probably have been 
fragmented simply because horses started to be uh, reproduced in, clo in closed studs. And this process, uh, process of fragmentation of the populations came first with a reduction of the genomic diversity that was available to the breeders, first consequence. But at the same time, it came also with a massive increase in the genetic load, which we define here as the total amount of deleterious variants that are uh, present in heterozygous, in heterozygous states in each individual genome. So there has been a consequence for the horse genome uh, that the consequence of this change in breeding practices is that individually horses, they have a higher genomic load, and in fact, they probably have a lower uh, genomic health, if you will. So to conclude, uh, I hope that I've convinced you that, I mean, we could do a lot of things with ancient genomes, and what we learn really is that there are only two horse lineages that still live on the planet today, and each descend from independent domestication processes. Uh, the bowtie descendants, they return to the wild in the form of the feral Shavalsky's horses, so they are not gone, and this gives uh, an, another incentive to keep um, um, uh, uh, protecting this horse population, not just because it went back to the wild and was endangered, but also because this is the only living population of the first domestication process that we could get access to. Uh, the Dom to lineage, the second domesticated one, expanded from the Ponte Caspian steppe around 4.2 thousand years ago, and it formed all the modern domestic breeds that we know of, regardless of where they live on the planet. So really, the second uh, domestication process was the true winner. It actually managed to replace every single lineage that was present in the past. And of course, during the last 4,000 years uh, selection, and admixture and changes in the breeding practices have truly impacted on the horse genomes, the horse genome in terms of the diversity that was available. But really, if you had to only keep one take home from this talk, I guess that what ancient genomes have, have helped us do is actually identify a huge amount of genetic variation in the horse populations during the, the last 50,000 years. Variation that we had no idea even existed, either from the, from the analysis of the modern variation or from the analysis of the morphological variation present in those particular horse groups. And perhaps the, the sad news that our work uncovered is that from this whole diversity, pretty much almost nothing. This is this uh, dashed circle in black that you see, almost nothing still exists in the form of the modern domesticates. So truly the last 50,000 of years have been dramatically impacting on horse diversity and came with a huge loss of genetic variation. And with that, uh, I would like to, of course, thank all my um, lab mates, my collaborators, uh, all of whom are excellent, uh, my sponsors, and of course, you for your kind attention. And I think that I'm going to stop there, and I will be happy to take any questions if you have any. Yes, Ludo, thank you so much. The questions are rolling in thick and fast already. Uh, clearly, you have struck a tone, uh, and it's fantastic to know that you have answered every question that anybody has ever had about horses, and yet we have some more. So uh, let me ask you the very first one that has come up. Can you comment on, or can you speculate on why you think Dom 2 was so much more successful than the lineage that led to Shavalsky's horses? Right, so there are two things I believe here. So one, I tried to, to, to allude to this today. One is that I think they had the genomic makeup that was simply um, more compatible with, with the selection uh, pressure that we created. So in the form of perhaps a behavior that was more practical, as well as a capacity to have a stronger back. So if you have this, of course, if the selection pressure comes with uh, horseback riding or pulling chariots, as I've seen, then you will have a strong advantage if you carry the right variant. So I think this, this speaks for one reason. They were genetically more predisposed to, uh, to this selection pressure. But the second one is uh, boils down to what happens to the bowtie people. 
we know from human genomic work that the Botai population, the human one, actually vanished somewhere around 5,000 years ago. And by that, I mean that there are not many human populations around Central Asia and around the world, in fact, that actually come together with some Botai-like ancestry after 5,000 years. So I think that these people, they simply disappeared. And uh, they, they probably disappeared together with their innovation to some extent. Oh. That's fascinating. So you could imagine a, a counterfactual world in which that horse lineage disappears and another Dom2 never happens and, and we don't have horses, which is <laughs> kind of curious. That would be sad. Um, two questions uh, closely related to one another, uh, asking you to comment on the sort of general perspectives about frill horse populations, including Mustangs or Brumbies or just uh, wild horse lineages in North America. Yeah, so this is a great question again. Um, as you said, all those populations are feral. At least this is our understanding. So if you sequence their genomes, um, this has been done by us uh, in Northern America, but this has been done also in other places. I'm thinking about you know, some feral populations, for example, in some islands in Canada uh, or the Sable Islands, for example, or in different type of populations. All what you see is that when you sequence the genome, they all maximize the DOM2 ancestry. They are very much like DOM2. So that means that indeed, they are not the descendants of wild populations that we have sequenced. They really look like DOM2s, right? So it means that they are in fact population that went back into the wild. And um, uh, of course, they did not went back into the wild all together at the same time. So you have a situation in which some different populations of horses actually started to not be exposed to human selection from diff different time periods. And we are really interested in my lab into using that to uh, uh, sequence the genomic variation, what happens to the genomic variation when it's, when it's not exposed to human agenda anymore. Excellent. Um, going back really quickly to the bow tie lineage, there's a, a really interesting question here that says, um, those two alleles that you were talking about, the favorable ones involved in the reduced aggression, aggression and the stronger backs, what is the variant of those that you see in bowtie? In other words, were they even heterozygous for that or were they homozygous for the allele yeah. that we don't now see in the modern domestics? Yeah, so this, this is a great question. So this is not a fixation. There is, there is actually some uh, um, standing variation in, in, in the bowtie as well to really low frequencies. Of course, the mutation did not emerge uh, only at the time at 4.2. It's not a de novo mutation. So it was around at low frequencies, but really what we saw is that if you look at the allelic trajectory of that derived variant, so it's not just a SNP, by the way, uh, this is a whole block of the genome that is actually longer than one megabase. So really the whole haplotype was, was selected at the same time. Uh, it was, uh, I think the FST value for, for, uh, for GSDMC will be around 87% or something like that. So it's, it's not a, a white and black situation, but it's reaching fixation in the dumb twos. Great, and just a couple of more questions here, Ludo, because um, they're, they're excellent. Um, of course, you, your, your uh, ancient data set is just astounding in terms of your, your breadth and your depth. And you're, you're, it's, we have like a, a horse every 50 years across all of Eurasia, which is kind of what you need because you're finding all of these populations that simply don't exist anymore. And this question is asking about the modern data set that you've got, because you can, you can understand how that might be ascertained as well if you're focusing for this, as this person is suggesting, exclusively on racing horses, for example. So what can you tell us a bit more about your modern data set compared? Yeah, again, as a super question. So. Um, so the modern data set, so first off, there are two ways to actually do the kind of work that we've done. Either you go whole genome sequencing, which is the, the road we opted for, or you would have got through capture, so targeting some genomic variation specifically. In our case, we didn't want to do that because, of course, the ascertainment will have been, will have been really biased towards some kind of modern variation. And it's a, it's a, we were really uh, lucky to, 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 to opt for, for this because as you saw, the genomic diversity in the past was really extraordinarily larger than it is today. So clearly we, we had to go whole genome, but uh, uh, sequencing. Um, in terms of the modern genome that we have, uh, we have in fact leveraged close to 300 genomes that are available from the literature, some of which we have 
uh, sequenced ourselves. Uh, but it's true that there, there is a strong bias in those uh, towards the, 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 the industrial breeds to some extent, not the feral horse populations, not the, uh, those that are just village horses, if you will. So what we've done, and this is unpublished work, uh, but we have done the data set now, is sequencing about 454, I think this is the exact number, of uh, horse genomes spread across the planet, targeting specific, specifically the village horses. Uh, so as to see whether we could uncover some additional variation that, uh, that is not found in the data set that is available from the literature. Fantastic. That's going to be outstanding. And, and one last question, uh, just to finish off and throw a little curveball at you. Uh, tell us about zebras. How do they fit? <laughs> so zebras. <laughs> <laughs> so it happens that we sequenced zebras a few years ago. That was back in 2015. Uh, but they are really uh, different species. They are as divergent to the horses that, than, than uh, donkeys are, if you will. So there is a horse branch in the equid evolutionary tree, and, this, and there is a non-horse branch. And the non-horse branch comes together with donkeys, zebras, and, and onagers, in fact. So, mm -hmm. So zebras, we haven't done much of an effort into sequencing all the zebras in the world and their populations. Uh, another group will have to do that, but I'm happy to tell you that we've done this effort on the donkeys though. So we, we are really interested now in comparing the uh, uh, um, evolutionary trajectory uh, of the horse domestication process and the donkey domestication process because they came together at about the same time within 5,000 years, but really did not start from same locations and were not selected for the very same reasons. So we really want to understand what was the difference in terms of patterns of, of usage by the ancient populations and in terms of their spread across the planet. Hmm. That's, that's the, the timing of that, the simultaneity of it is something that's absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm hearing from the producers that if you are happy to take some more questions, there's some more here, unless you've sure, got somewhere sure. else to be. Great. Okay. Yeah, sure. uh, we'll keep going as, as long as there's questions and as long as Ludo is happy to, to entertain us. Um, there's a great question here about how, of course, the selection on horses for uses or kind of the way in which we interact with them, including sort of riding and perhaps even milking or a variety of other things, as soon as you go through that process of feralization, where now the selection pressure shifts away from people, can you see that recorded in the genome as well? And is what is that sort of process of, as this uh, questioner is asking about, de-domestication? Yeah, so I cannot answer that question specifically because we have generated the data, but we have not finished analyzing this. But really, this is the idea, right? So imagine that you have a feral population, say a horse population from an island that was actually colonized at a given time in the past, say a thousand years ago, and then was abandoned. And the same process can take place somewhere else from the same gum to background right, say 500 years ago. So now you have two points, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, where you could actually measure at the scale of the whole genome what happens genetically to those populations in terms of how fast they will perhaps recover in terms of genomic load, for example, mm. or how fast they will actually uh, uh, lose um, or, or get enriched in some particular variants. So uh, with this very ID, what we did was sequencing a, a range of, of feral population within the last, say, 500 years. And uh, we are really analyzing the data in terms of the trajectories now. Hmm, cool, that's gonna be outstanding. Um, a really cool question here about integration. Uh, and it's asking specifically about any potential for horses, uh, about migration over bearing land bridges and the horses in, in North America having received some genomic material from uh, some of the horses that were here maybe well before that, although I know about uh, going extinct in the LGM. But what about even more generally about integration from local horse populations that were not part of the domestication process into domesticates that arrived there later on? Right. So you're asking to put it in another way, whether or not there is evidence of non dom to genomic ancestry into the um, Native American horses, in fact, right? Um, that would be example. that would be a, a more efficient way of asking that question. Yes. OK, <laughs> so clearly uh, Beth Shapiro's uh, lab, we collaborated about a year ago. Well, we've been collaborating for, for, for ages, really. But she led a paper last year showing very convincingly at the genomic level that East and west of Beringia, there has been like some gene flow both ways. Uh, really, uh, east to west, uh, 
mostly 700,000 years ago and about 120,000 years ago, west to east and east to west. So clearly Beringia was not you know, a barrier to uh, horse gene flow. So clearly there are ancestries going back and forth, but um, it seems that if you, if you use all these data, so uh, those ancient Northern American horse genomes prior to, L, uh, to the extinction at the end of the LGM and those that we have sequenced in, in Eurasia, uh, it doesn't seem that that you have an enrichment of any non done to ancestry into the genomes of those feral populations of horses living today in Northern America. So it seems that as far as, you know, wild ancestry introgressing specifically in the Americas and not in Eurasia, it doesn't seem that we see that in the past that we have. Cool. Um, how concerned are you about this, the, the lack of variability or the loss of variability? And is that comparable to any other animals over such a short period of time? I mean, is this, is this a big deal when you look more globally at other taxa? Right. So I think, I mean, one of the species that you are really yourself very interested in, the dogs, I mean, it must be even crazier, I guess, right, in terms of the, mm -hmm. the bottleneck that they have faced. Uh, what happens here that is specific to the horses, in fact, is that, remember, there is only one genomic background, the DOM2. And probably that background, as you saw from the demographic trajectory, it started from only not a handful, but from not a huge amount of, of horses in the first place. And then there is this massive uh, uh, spread and uh, demographic expansion at the scale of the whole of Eurasia. So in terms of their differentiation, they only have at best 4,000 years to, to differentiate from, right? So in terms of if you calculate the FSTs between different breeds even today, like you will be surprised how small it is, right? Mm -hmm. So to start with, the amount of genetic variation was, was low. That, that's my point. It was not high in the, in, it was not great in fact, right? So, and now there is 16 more person that have been lost. So clearly it is a concern. And I think that what we should be trying to, to help with is really use our genomic tools to really assess which populations of you know, feral horses or non-industrial breeds that are still roaming around today to sort of recover some small bits of diversity that would have been lost in the last 200 years in the mainstream breeds, if you will, right? But I think this is a double concern. There was not so much variation to start with and there is not so much left anymore after, mm -hmm. the, after this drop. That's a good point. Uh, and I'm sure with dog breeds, there is, is clearly an analogy there. Um, there was a controversial paper about a decade ago that was based solely on some mitochondrial variation that just tried to do an estimate about how many touring cattle were involved in that maybe initial bottlenecking process, which I'm not a huge fan of. But given that you've got genomes now and you've got so many, um, so much insight into the variability across all these different populations, could you put an estimate onto the number of DOM2 horses that were involved in this original selection pressure? I mean, would you I want cannot, to go that far? Are I we talking not from the top of my head, but yeah, of course, from the data, we can do that. In mm -hmm. fact, if I recall correctly, the MT variation that we have, the starting point just prior to the expansion, uh, there was uh, about a 50-fold uh, expansion, and I think it was 10 to the power of four to five, depending on the maternal or, or paternal lineage uh, here. Uh, so it was it was not a small population, but it was... Uh, it was it was in the range of yeah what I've just said, but of course this is based on uniparental markers, so this is not mm. very precise, you know. Uh, so what we are doing now is actually modeling the trajectory of at the demographic level based on uh, autosomal SNP variation, not only for the DOM twos, but for each and every lineage that we uncovered, to sort of mm. see whether what I've said, for example, before that the bowtie were actually at the brink of extinction, that they became they became almost extinct at the same time as the humans, and how many of the other populations were in fact available as we domesticated them too. Hmm. And you mentioned that giant drop in Y uh, diversity recently, but very early on, are you are you seeing any differential between mitochondria and Y? I mean, it looks pretty even. Yeah, there's a best, there is a fifty. Yeah, there is at least a. a a tenfold log difference between the MT and the Y chromosomal variation up front. And we, the way we interpret this is that uh, it's because of the mating behavior of horses in which you have a dominant stallion uh, dominating like tons of, uh, of reproducing mares, in fact. So clearly you will expect a sort of 
lower effective size at the paternal lineage than the maternal lineage for this reason. And the drop of, of genetic variation on the Y chromosome, which is amazing in horses, because in the modern world, there is only a limited amount of haplotypes that you have, right? And they are all very related, in fact. But this drop took place only in the last 1.3 thousand years. There is excellent work from Barbara Warner's lab uh, documenting this for the last decade. Uh, so this drop in Y chromosome is only a, a recent drop coming with the influence of what we call the oriental horses, those that we depict as, you know, the Barbs, the Ottomans, or the Turkish, or the Arabians, right? Um, and wasn't it true just a couple of years ago at the Kentucky Derby that every single horse in that race was a half brother? Yeah, so in 2018, I think the, uh, the uh, I think, so on the Derby, you have 20 horses uh, on the on the track, right? And, uh, and I think 13 was half brothers, and all of them, they were related to Mr. Prospector. So clearly a horse that was actually born in the 70s. Uh, uh, I think it's the, 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 the son or the grandson of, of Secretaria in type, right? right? So yeah, very true. Uh, there is, especially in the farbred industry, uh, there is a strong pattern of not only relatedness, because relatedness will not necessarily be bad, right? Uh, but in breeding. In type. Right. Interesting. Um, really cool question here about have you observed any larger structural or copy number variations related with morphological changes? Yeah, so that's a massive, massive question, very complicated to answer. So we haven't really uh, uh, done a lot on CNVs uh, for one particular reason, which is not the good one, is that it's probably very difficult to do that with ancient data, because remember our reads, they are about 50 base per long. So the only thing that we could really leverage is uh, patterns of lateral variation of coverage along the genome. So it doesn't mean that we can't really do that. There is a, we have resolution into some CNVs at a scale of a few KBs. So we should really do more. But what I didn't tell you today is actually the this FST peak, the selection peak that we have on GSDMC is actually located in a structural variant. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this block is actually uh, flanked by, uh, by, by two signs. So clearly this is probably an, a, a complex event uh, uh, coming from the uh, transposition or the insertion of, of a new genomic block in the promoter of the GSDMC. And we are really looking at that, as well as epigenetic changes in terms of DNA methylation in this very location, because we saw evidence of, uh, of more extensive uh, cytosine deamination at this very location, which can be easily explained by an excess of DNA methylation there. So it's not just a situation such as the ZFPM1 in which you have one block and just a selection on the block at the SNP variation level, but you have probably a new block coming in and driving changes in the expression involving changes in DNA methylation that are selected into the uh, into the DOM2. So a very complex story that we didn't put in the original paper because we are not sure that we have fully understood what was going on there. Hmm. Fascinating, very cool. And uh, very last question here, Ludo. It's, it's well known that your own personal relationship with horses is not maybe as good as it could be. And I think there's quite a few people here who would love to know how that's going. Are you now riding horses comfortably? And could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah, I was notorious uh, in this horse community for not being a rider myself, which is exceptional. I think they're all horse lovers. So I'm a horse lover, but I didn't ride much uh, when I was younger. But two years ago, actually, my wife um, took me lessons uh, for horse riding. And uh, for the last two years, I've started riding myself. So I'm gallop free now, which means I'm, I suck at riding, but still I'm improving. Gallop three out of what? What's the highest you can achieve? Seven, seven. Wow, you're halfway there. Nicely done. Yeah. <laughs> All right, one well, very last question that keeps coming in here. Um, is there any noticeable structural variation uh, such as translocation and or inversion in different populations? Yeah, I think I don't know will be my short answer, but mm. I'm not even sure we do know, uh, we as a community. There are excellent papers uh, uh, from Julia Metzger, for example, Otmar Diesel's lab, where they have looked at structural variants into some specific populations or breeds, 
especially those from, from Germany. But beyond that, there are other examples in specific breeds, but I'm not aware of any large scale study focusing on structural variation in the domestic horses living today. Uh, this is not even done for the Shavolskis, even though the Shavolskis have an additional pair of chromosomes. Uh, they don't have the same karyotype. So this would, I mean, there's, you were saying that we sequenced everything. So now there are no longer any questions. I mean, you can see that there are tons of questions still pending. Absolute. Um, and how, how relevant are mules in the, in the modern scenario? Very much relevant. Uh, one of the projects that we are trying to finish now uh, is, is focusing on the mules. Uh, and we are uh, asking a lot of questions here. I think I can, I can come with at least two from the top of my head. One is when did we start breeding mules? Mm -hmm. uh, this is not obvious, right? So mules as the uh, F1 of uh, horse mare and, uh, and the donkey jack, right? So, uh, but also in terms of the reciprocal uh, uh, cross, like the hinnies, when is it that we started doing that? Because when you have mule, you're given a new capacity for transportation, you know, and they cost a lot at breeding because they don't reproduce, they are sterile. But once you have them, uh, they can do a lot more work and they don't need to drink as much and they don't need to eat as much, right? So of course, this would be fascinating to see when is it they kick in. So at the scale of the world, I cannot answer that question. But what I can tell you is that we got a paper uh, published about a month ago on this very question in Western Europe. So this doesn't this is not necessarily true for the rest of the world, but in Western Europe, we see mules kicking in um, during the Roman times, but massively uh, so. Uh, during Roman times, you know, this is an empire with huge roads expanding everywhere in Western Eurasia, including down to Northern Africa, in fact. And the logistics of maintaining such an empire require transportation in terms of the logistic of feeding the army, bringing the weapons, and transporting stuff from a region to the next. And at that time period, there is about 35% of the equid bones that we can see in the archaeological record that will belong to mules, in fact. So one every three equid will be a mule in that time period. So at that time, they really matter. The other two thirds are horses. So it means that surprisingly, there are no donkeys, even though you need the donkeys to breed mules. And that we interpret by saying that there is probably donkey somewhere, but um, specialized for mule breeding. So you only have the jacks somewhere, kept somewhere in some particular places, so as to produce and produce more and more and more uh, mules. So that is true for the, 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 the Roman time. But what is interesting, at least to me, is that when the Western Roman Empire collapses, somewhere around the sixth century of uh, our era, the Common Era, so somewhere around 1400 years, uh, we don't see mules anymore in Western Europe. There will be only a few percent of them in the archaeological record. And all of in a sudden, you still have the one and the one third and two third. The two thirds are still the horses, but the one third now is the donkey. So it seems that when you don't have the incentive for really logistics, long distance transportation, the Roman Empire, when you lose this incentive, it's not worth anymore economically to invest in mule breeding because you're better off if you don't use them so much for long distance transportation, you're better off to breed some donkeys and horses because you can reproduce the next generation forever, basically. So you see that it's not just one, one animal that we have bred, it's actually a whole ecosystem of equids, mules, donkeys, and horses that we actually manage depending on the uh, changes in the political agenda or the historical changes in our home populations. Wow. Well, Ludo, thank you so much. This has been, a, it's a real thrill. And um, I would love to, uh, let's go get a drink at Charlie's now and spend the rest of the evening talking about <laughs> everything else that's going on. Uh, and if maybe not tonight, maybe a year from now, I think it's probably a good Next year. We owe Next you a whole lot of drinks for this. This has been an absolute stellar talk. And thank you so much for sticking around as long as you have, especially given the late hour uh, in your hometown this evening. So um, thank you again, everybody, for, for the two brilliant plenary talks this afternoon. This morning, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you happen to be. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow for a couple more fantastic talks. And once again, Ludo, thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much. Cheers.